a huge scam. It's a huge thing. scam. And in California, the courts have ruled that arbitrators are not even required to follow the law. There are two very distinct classifications for gig economy workers, skilled and unskilled. If you're skilled, chances are pretty good that you're living the dream promoted by the gig economy industry. However, if you're an unskilled gig worker, chances are just as good that you're getting screwed. If you're poor or trapped in a situation with no good options, you're probably living in a never-ending daily crisis. This is the focus of our story today on the very real situation millions of unskilled gig economy workers are confronting while trying to keep a roof over their heads and food on their tables, exacerbated by a pandemic here in the United States that didn't need to happen. I'll be joined in just a minute by my special guest, Heather Bussing. Welcome to Total Picture Media and another edition of WTF 2020, An Influencer's Guide to Navigating the Shit Show. My name is Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Please leave your comments below. Here's my opinion of the current administration. Hit me with that pestle. You're lucky I didn't hit you with a mortar. <laughs> the mortar to marry you. Quiet. Ow! Put that pestle down, man. Mixer! Mixer! Between COVID-19, climate change, Black Lives Matter, our political shit show, including the starring role of a fly in a political debate. Yeah, that actually happened. A government in complete disarray with no leadership, no conscience, no integrity, no honesty. It feels like we're all sitting in rubber rafts heading down a particularly perilous section of the Colorado River, and no one knows if we're going to make it through this catastrophe alive. I heard that the supporters of of this president are threatening to leave the country if he loses the election. Really? Well, first of all, good riddance, but where exactly do they think they're going to go? Maybe Somalia, rated the most corrupt country in the world by Transparency International in 2019. However, Somalia is in the Horn of Africa, so I doubt those folks would want to go there. But let's transition to something far more positive. I think the group of influencers, thought leaders, subject matter experts, innovators, and visionaries I've invited to participate in the WTF 2020 series have given all of us some inspiration, a renewed sense of purpose, or at least some actionable ideas and hope. Today, I'm delighted to welcome to Total Picture Media, Heather Bussing, attorney, writer, analyst, and a damn good photographer. Heather, welcome. Heather, (laughs) welcome. Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. (laughs) Oh, it's true. Uh, Are you and John still Fleeing from the fires torching torching California? No, the fires are pretty much under control. Um, we we evacuated in August, but then the one that happened in September, we were not in that one's path. But but it's taken until about two or three days ago for the skies to clear and the smoke to be gone and for everything to be the right color again. <laughs> Wow. Well, as most of you watching or listening to this probably know, Heather is married to John Sumzer, who is chief analyst at HR Examiner, podcaster, and all-around terrific human being. And I recently interviewed John for the WTF 2020 series, and I'll put a link in the show notes here. So, Heather, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're currently working on. Yeah, so I've been an employment lawyer for over 30 years now, (laughs) and um, when I met John, I started uh, writing for uh, recruiting blogs, actually, and that's how how I started into the HR tech and recruiting world, and um, have you know, started writing for the HR examiner. So, so I still practice employment law part-time in California. 
and um, I do a little bit of a lot of different things. And then I also ha uh, do a lot of freelance and contract writing, some in the HR tech area and some legal writing briefs for other lawyers. Um, I've been working from home for about 12 years, so <laughs> so so that hasn't changed with the pandemic for me. And you know, I I'm one of those people that is curious about a lot of different things, and so I I do a lot of different things, but usually just one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that makes two of us. I I have I I share the curiosity bug. Or whatever it is. Yeah. But so so let's talk about employment law, which seems to me to have traditionally been on the side of business, the company, the corporation. Is that a correct assessment? And how has uh, COVID nineteen impacted employment law? In April, when the when the Stimulus Act, the CARES and the Families First Coronavirus Act um, were were going into effect and then the rules that were coming out <laughs> implementing it that often did not match the text of the statute. Um, we were all sort of pulling out our hair and trying to figure out what everything meant and helping people um, implement them in their companies or figure out where to go for the PPP loans. I mean, it was just, it's been insane. And then on the HR tech side, all of these things affected payroll and um, compliance issues. And so, you know, there were there were coders working twenty four seven to get to get all the payroll programs updated. Um, so it's uh, it's been it's been a little nuts. Um, and we're still dealing with issues of what happens when somebody gets COVID and dies. You know, I, someone asked me the other day, where do I send their final paycheck? Wow. You know, yeah. and it's just heartbreaking. Um, it is just absolutely heartbreaking. And, you know, employees who got laid off, you know, can't afford their insurance. And it's just... Um, it's it's, it's a, a shit it, show. It's a shit show. <laughs> yeah. It's or a complete cluster. Yeah. yeah. I mean yeah. it is brutal and um and heartbreaking. It's it's been exhausting. <laughs> and of course, every state has its own rules and regulations uh around employment law. So yeah. it even becomes more confusing. And then there's states like Florida who really don't give a shit. It seems because they have computer systems that are running COBOL, which right. was, you know, was uh, taken out of most corporations about 30 years ago, I think. And they're trying to, they're running around trying to find people who can still program in COBOL who have all right. retired, right? Right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. But, uh, you know, going back to your question, I think the role of employment law is, is changing. Um, you know, I think the role of HR is changing. Um, it's been very compliance oriented. And I think what we're seeing now is people saying, wait a minute, um, law is inadequate to change things by itself. And we need to step back and look at ethics and look at policy, look at what's fair and look at you know, what our corporate responsibility is, what our our moral obligations are to fellow human beings, um, especially in contrast with what's going on with our government. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Heather, as you know, there are a lot of economists projecting that over 50 percent of the independent restaurants in New York City won't survive this pandemic. Um, according to Stephen Dubner on Freakonomics Radio, the New York City is being run by a comically inept mayor, as he puts it. And of course, in California, Heather, you've got not only COVID-19 to deal with, but the horrific fires that have happened all summer, thanks to climate change. So yep. what's the prognosis for the San Francisco Bay Area and Napa Valley, which depends so heavily on tourism and, oh yeah, you know, like clean air? Right. 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 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, we need to get climate change under control. And um, global warming is here. It was the hottest September on record in California this year. Um, and, and the fires, you know, I think will be a cyclical thing, depending on weather and, and, you know, when we have rainy wind, when we have rainy winters, you would think that that would reduce fire, but it makes everything grow and then it dries out and creates fuel. So, so we'll see. Um, the prognosis for the Bay Area is, is an interesting thing. We're seeing tech workers move um, out of the area to someplace quieter and less e expensive. Right. Um, and the, the Napa Valley, I think people will continue to come to. You know, when you drive around, it doesn't look that much different. You know, the, the wineries are there, the vineyards, it's beautiful. Um, and the, the, the fires are up on the hills um, in the sort of wild forested areas. So I, I think the tourism um, will continue to thrive because it is beautiful and, and, you and know, there's good wine <laughs> and it's great wine and yeah. it's, and it's easy to get to, you know? Right. Uh, so, so we see a, a lot of tourists here because we can't go anywhere else right now. Right. right. <laughs> People right. are not getting on airplanes and you can't get into other countries. So you drive, you know, a few hours and stay at a B and B. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, you know I I love California. Big Sur is like my favorite magic place. I lived in yeah. Santa Monica for many oh. years, and and that's a beautiful a beautiful place. And it's just you know it's just heartbreaking to see what climate change is is doing. And you know you're the canary in the coal mine. I yeah. mean, what's happening in California is not going to stay in California, right? Right. So, so one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you, Heather, is uh, a ProPublica investigative report titled Meet the Customer Service Reps for Disney and Airbnb Who Have to Pay to Talk to You, co-published by Planet Money. And I'll put a link to the ProPublica article in the show notes. So uh, there I was, Heather, on my exercise mat, groaning through some stretching exercises, listening to Planet Money. And not believing what I'm hearing, but of course, it's true, and it involves the work-from-home industry, and it's an industry, and, and how is, I said in the opening, unskilled workers are getting completely royally screwed, and I can't think of a more insidious and, and effective screwer than a company called Arise Virtual Solutions. So uh, when I mentioned this to you, you went, oh, yeah. So tell us about Arise and, and their business model. Yeah, well, basically, they they hire people to do telephone customer service for a variety of their clients. And they pay minimum wage to do that. But then they also, um, they treat them as independent contractors. So they build them for training and they make them buy all of their own tools and equipment, which is normal um, independent contracting, except that the, the workers have no negotiating power for the wages, unlike normal independent contractors. So then they overhire for the jobs to make sure they have enough people to staff. And so that means that you could be asked to join a gig and pay a hundred or two hundred dollars for training and special equipment or something and never get any work. So it's it's manifestly unfair to the workers because they have absolutely no bargaining power and no benefits and no rights as employees. They're just um, taking a chance on getting to do some call center work. Yeah, it's, you know, this article is just mind boggling. And of course, they all have to sign contracts, which um, state that, you know, that they cannot 
reveal any information about their uh, their work. They uh, that anything if there's a dispute, it has to go through arbitration. Uh, they can't take it to court. So I would like you to explain to um, our viewers exactly what's involved in arbitration because I think this is a, a key to how Arise and and other companies of the same ilk really are able to stay in business. Yeah, so arbitration is is private court, um, and the parties pay for it. it when you have an employer employee situation, the employer is usually required to pay all the fees. But with contractors, the parties can share the cost. So you could potentially have to pay the judge who charges, you know, that there are some here that charge $6,000 a day um, to do these, plus an attorney to help you do it and get ready. And then the person who decides it, um, they're their decision is binding and there is absolutely no appeal in most places unless they exceeded the authority that you gave them in the agreement that you were forced to sign. <laughs> so, um, so it's expensive. And the other thing is that those uh, companies that do private arbitration stay in month, stay in business because they want companies to require in the contract to use their entity. So, so they become dependent on these arbitrations financially and become biased. Um, so it, you know, it, it's a huge scam. It's the a huge thing. scam. And in California, the courts have ruled that arbitrators are not even required to follow the law. That's just as mind boggling. Yeah. To me. It really yeah. is. You know, so and, it's another expensive crapshoot. <laughs> and and another aspect of this whole arise situation uh, is the fact that when you sign one of these contracts, you are actually working for a third party. So you're three rings down, if you will. From so you know, in all of this stuff that that I've been reading about, arise is they work so hard to make sure that there's no question that you could even remotely be considered an employee. I mean, they don't refer to their managers as supervisors. They have some weird ass name for them, right? And so you basically either have to incorporate yourself right, to be a corporation, to uh, have one of these call center jobs, which, by the way, uh, you look at the list of companies who uh, are uh, Arise's clients, and it's, it's an impressive list of blue, you know, of blue chip companies. Yeah. Um, Arise's list of corporate clients, past and present, include Airbnb, Comcast, Instacart, Disney, Amazon, Apple, AT&T, Barnes & Noble, eBay, Intuit, Home Depot, Staples, Princess Cruises, Peloton, Signet Jewelers, which is Jared, um, Virgin Atlantic, and Walgreens. And it is now owned by Warburg Pinnacus, the private equity firm, where former Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner is president. So... <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, right? Yeah, well, it's hard to <sighs> know what these companies understand. You know, they just are paying a fee to have, you know, well, warm that's bodies what, that's on what the what end they of the all phone. say is, you know, yeah. we're not responsible for these idiots that we hire at all. So then why are you hiring them? If you know that they're running these scams, what and they have to know. This, you know, and I don't remember the 10K that Disney came out with last year, but they made a few billion dollars. Right. So why do they have to? Well, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. There are many, many different kinds of um, agencies that 
that staff jobs. And some of them employ the workers and provide benefits. And some of them treat them as 1099 contractors. And then some of them are like this, you know. <laughs> so um, so I, you know, I would be, I would be speculating to to say that any of these companies truly understand, although they should know by now based on, you know, the publication. But um and, and just it just seems to me like there there are a number of very unscrupulous people riding on this gravy train that are just going out and you know and these most of these people I would think are are really victims. They're you know, apparently that they really target the minority communities and, you know, single moms who are forced to stay at home because they have young children and, or, you know, they, they don't own a car. And so they're, they're very limited by what they can do. And these companies just prey on them. You, yeah. you have to buy your own equipment. You're, these people are spending thousands of dollars on computers and phone lines and fax machines and headsets and maybe not fax machines, <laughs> maybe not fax machines anymore. <laughs> let's hope, but uh, you know, they, they have to have, um, two phone lines coming into their homes. They have right. to have headsets. They have to have yeah. a, uh, a good computer and, um, you know, uh, an expensive Wi-Fi network that they're connected to. Yeah. Um, and this is all on them. All yep. the training that they do, they have to pay for their own training. Sometimes to the to the companies. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then when the companies pay these people, they take a cut because they consider themselves a platform. So it's sort of like you Uber or or you know or Instacart, right? Where they think of themselves as a platform. So if you're if you're on our platform, then we're going to charge you a fee. So they get right. charged a fee by a rise. Then they get charged a fee by whatever company that they are actually working with um, to work with a rise because they can't work directly with a, a rise. Right. It's just, right. it's mind boggling yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Um, it's something that California has been grappling with. Um, a few years ago, the state Supreme Court sort of tightened the test for who's an independent contractor to add whether this person is doing the work of an employee. You know, is this the normal work of this company? And so, um, so the legislature came in and codified that and targeted um, Uber and Lyft and and said, you know, these people are basically employees. And that's fighting its way through both federal and state courts right now. And then this, this election cycle, there's a proposition to, um, to revoke this bill um, that, that made it harder. And it's it's interesting because there are puts and takes. You know, there are people like me who work as an independent contractor and I'm truly independent. You know, I right. negotiate my rates. I have my own business. Um, I'm not buying special equipment for you. You know, I, I like the freedom. I like the autonomy. There are tax benefits to being able to write off my office and, and lots of reasons um, to be an independent contractor if you have a fair negotiating power, right? If you have a skill. And it, you know, it's, exactly. It's back to, yeah, I just, um, exactly. I just hired a, a WordPress expert in Dallas and paid him $55 an hour and it was worth every yeah. penny oh, that I spent, absolutely. you know, absolutely. and this guy is working 24 hours a day for people who yeah. do WordPress stuff. Right. So, so, so there it, are legitimate people out there and, um, and writers and photographers and creatives, you know, do people have in-house marketing? Sure. But can they hire me to write something? 
yes, but then there's this legal question, you know, um, whether whether that's the work of the company or not, right? Right. So so there's a lot of confusion. It's created a hassle for um, small businesses like um, massage therapists who often um, work through a central agent who, you know, helps navigate the, the times and scheduling and everything. So it's just, um, it's, it's interesting. And yet, yet when you see a situation like a rise where people don't really have control over when they work, they don't have control over their wages or compensation. They don't have the autonomy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's taking advantage and it's unfair and it should be illegal, but it's really tricky to try to figure out where those lines get drawn and how you tell the difference. Well, there, there was actually a Supreme court ruling recently uh, that was tied to a rise and um, the good guys lost five to four. And the majority opinion was written by Trump appointee Neil Gossage. And so there you go. It's more than just abortion stuff, right? Right. With these guys. <laughs> right. A lot more. Well, it, you know, it's capitalism taken to its logical extreme, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one way of putting it. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> if, if your priority is profit and, you know, At corporations... All, you know, for, for Corporations any reason, are you know, designed for, to create profit. That's right. their goal. It's a system. Systems do what they're designed to do. Um, and so if that's the goal, then cost is the only thing that matters. Uh, I, I recently interviewed Jeff Wald, who um, was a co-founder of Work Market, which was bought by ADP. And... You know, he said you know, this, and, and you had brought this up. This this uh, case out in California having to do with Uber and Lyft called California AB five, right. which is sort of on hold now because of the pandemic. But it's Jeff's opinion that once there's a, a vaccine and and we're, we're sort of beyond the lockdown stage, that other states are going to bring up laws similar to AB5, because as we all know, it's in the government's interest to have people on W-2s, not 1099s, because they make their money off right. of people who are on right. W-2s. No. Right? Um, yeah, I think 60% of the federal government's budget comes from payroll yeah. income At least. tax collection. Yeah. And, and contractors don't pay regularly they pay quarterly if they if they're paying this year right you know right <laughs> so so there's a strong governmental incentive for people to be employees and um yeah that's that's exactly right well well let's sh shift our focus just a little bit here because you are very heavily involved in what uh uh HR examiner is writing about and thinking about and, um, you know, the, the uh, software that HR and talent acquisition people are using. So what are some of the trends that you are seeing that may get implemented in, in, in 2021? We went from big data to the cloud to now AI, right? Right. And so, so the idea with big data was, wow, we can collect all of this information and, and start to process it. And it's cheap. You can put it in the cloud and you can get to it anywhere. And now they're starting to do things with that data, um, like predictive analytics and, and recommendations and things beyond just calculations and and it's it's still all mathification, you know, <laughs> where where everything's a measurement and they compare things um, either quantitatively or, uh, well, I guess it's pretty much all quantitative. But um, so 
so we're starting to see new tools that that don't just give you reports about facts. They give you opinions. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a 30% chance that Peter is going to quit. Um, okay, what do you do with that, right? <laughs> I guess it depends on whether you want Peter to stay with your company or not, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you know, how do you how do you quantify what does 30% chance mean, right? If it's a 30% chance it's gonna rain, um, I'm probably gonna leave without an umbrella. If there's a 30% chance that the plane is going down, I am not getting on it. Right. Right? So yeah. so we we don't, you know, while we walk through the world and make predictions in everything we do, you know, that car's going to turn left. Um, you know, it's going to be cooler in the shade. Um, we don't really know how to argue with the information that our computers give us. And we're used to computers giving us answers or making things more efficient. And some of these new tools just give us another factor to consider in an already complex decision. And so what I'm seeing is that companies are starting to understand this and understand that they need to help their users figure out how to use this, these, these new tools, and that raises ethical issues. And so I'm seeing a lot of focus now on not just what we can do, but also should we be doing this? Right. And if we do, how can we do it in a way that is responsible and fair and doesn't amplify bias or reduce privacy? So, um, yeah, so it's it's a really interesting time and I and it flows back into what we were talking about at the beginning, which is sort of companies and corporations um taking up social responsibility and 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 not just being, you know, a compliance servant to the law. Yeah. And you know, I, I keep hearing horror stories of supervisors insisting that their employees who are working from home keep their Zoom camera on all day long so they can monitor and see, you know, make sure that they're working, which to me is just, you got, you know, you got to be right. kidding me, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So if you, if you, if you are paying money for someone to watch somebody else work, your priorities are really messed up. Yeah, no you know? kidding. Let the person have the extra hour on the clock. It's going to be cheaper than paying the monitors, right? Jeez, come on. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and but it does, I, I think a lot of these ethics issues around HR are, are really interesting um, because we all know that a lot of companies track everything you do on your keyboard, on your computer, every website you visit, they're tracking everything that you're writing, uh, your, all of your emails, uh, yep. they're tracking your company issued iPhone or Android phone, uh, the GPS to figure out where you are at what time of the day. I mean, this yep. is this is really big brother shit that we're dealing with here. Right. I mean, and nobody looks at most of it, but they can. Right. At any time they want. Um, and some there are programs that, you know, give off alerts if something, you know, weird happens. So somebody who's supposed to be in Indiana is suddenly in Ohio, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> with the company car <laughs> right, right. and, and Amex. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, some of that monitoring provides useful information if it gets anonymized and then used responsibly, right? Um, and others, it it's just an invasion of privacy. And so these these are really important issues and we have to figure out how what our culture believes about privacy 
Um, in Europe, privacy is part of human dignity. It is, it is a given. You could walk down a nude beach and you would not be harassed because, you know, you, it's part of treating each other with respect and dignity. And here, privacy is this sort of the cowboy independence. I get to do what I want. I, you know, the, there's legal language that talks about the right to be left alone. But it's also, you know, the right to know what people are doing with your information. Um, it's the right to be able to walk through the world without surveillance or to understand, you know, where and how you're being surveilled. So there's, there's all sorts of issues and the law is designed to work with people, places and things. And surveillance and, and digital technology and most of the work we do, you know, is not exactly a person, place or thing anymore. Um, and so it's a really interesting time to see the world move um, far ahead of the law. And I'm not sure that the law will ever really be able to catch up. Um, it's sort of a, a wild west. And, yeah. and we need to ha use other tools besides the law to manage it. From your perspective, obviously so many of the HR and TA tech companies this year have been forced out of business uh, or had to uh, merge with other companies. I mean, um, higher view just bought Alio. What are you seeing out there as far as all of these HR tech companies and their ability to grow market share in what is a completely confusing market? Yes. Right? Yes. It, yeah. And it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen. Um, you know, when things are uncertain, people tend to go with the big companies for stability. Right. And when things are booming, you know, then then it's okay to take a chance with a startup and try the new whiz bang thing. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting perspective and I think you're absolutely right when when every when the economy is cooking and everything is going really well, um people are more willing to be risk takers and to right. get out of their comfort zone a little bit and try something new whereas What's going on today is, uh, oh, well, we have to work with Oracle because we know that they're not going to go out of business tomorrow or you know, right. whatever the rationale and justification right. is, you know, and it's, yeah. it's sort of my fear of what's happening with restaurants in New York. I mean, all, are all we going to be left with is McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken? I mean. No, I mean, <laughs> I I think. I think New York will probably figure it out before everybody else. I mean, they've always had a thriving takeout and delivery business, right? That's true. They have always done that. And so we're going to see smaller restaurants that are more kitchen and less seating. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, more chefs and fewer servers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but. Food is a necessity, and and people who are working, you know, don't always have time to cook, and it's just you know sharing a meal. It it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, you know, back to California AB five for just a second, because you know, selfishly, I really like taking Ubers, uh -huh. right? Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, when you look at the statistics and I, I think the average Uber driver makes about $6 an hour after they have to pay for all the maintenance on their car, their gasoline, the insurance, uh, that's, that's a pretty bleak picture. Um, do you think that AB5 is eventually going to become law and will other, uh, states, pick up on this and have similar laws enacted? 
I don't know. It's possible. Um, I think I think there are ways to manage it and uh, and and still keep the um, independent contractor model, but it involves paying more. You know, right. so that people are actually taking home at least minimum wage. Um, and minimum wage is too low right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so there has to be a fairer bargain um, that is more transparent about what the worker actually receives as compensation after expenses, what the net take home is. And, and I don't know if the, the companies that are using these models can afford that, but it seems like they can, and it, it may be cheaper than hiring as employees, um, but it's hard to know. Yeah, and it's, you know, when you look at the number of companies that have independent contractors working for them, companies like Google, I, I believe they have more independent contractors than they have full-time employees, and uh, Intuit is the same, and, and a number of companies, um, which provides uh, the ability to be much more flexible. And, and I think it, it also gets to the idea that so many companies are embracing now for task-based work rather than having somebody who's, you know, a VP of, of this or that. And it's all related to, all right, here's the project here. Here are the skills that we need to complete this, this project. So it's becoming much more project-based, which of course uh, begs for independent contractors because that's traditionally right. how they're hired. I mean, you look at Hollywood, it's all based on independent contract work. Sure. Right. It has to be because it's you, you go to really work on a, on a movie projects. or a, yeah, a TV exactly. series, and that's what you that's what you're working on. And when it's right. over, it's over. Right. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it seems like companies are really looking to embrace that type of a paradigm for their businesses, where you know a project has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and when it's over, you've got. 30 independent contractors who no longer are needed. Yeah. I mean, it's a very industrial model um, and it, it sort of flies in the face of things like growth and stability and policy and institutional knowledge right. and, and management. All that traditional and, stuff that and we've grown up with. research and development yeah. and, you know, the future of organizations. I think if you break it down into its component parts, it's not a situation where, you know, the, the, the parts are, are far less than the whole. And pretty soon, you know, what you're just down the rabbit hole in, in doing things rather than creating an overarching, um, you know, future for an organization. You have to, you have to create and you have to build and you have to plan ahead. And, um, and if you've got a constantly churning workforce and are cutting out layers of management, I don't know how you do that. Yeah. How, how do you do a, a five-year plan with temp work? Right. 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 Yeah. Well, Heather, I really appreciate you taking time to speak with me today. Is there anything uh, that has inspired you over the past few months? My, I have become a gardener. I, I am a new gardener. Um, I have roots in, in farming. My grandparents were farmers. Um, but, uh, but I never have really been a plant and flower and and so I have I have a wildflower garden in the back and I have raised beds with vegetables and I just re-landscaped the front yard <laughs> <laughs> that is and it is saving my life yeah, it, you, know? you know that is so interesting I talked to so many people that are doing the same thing and I, I'll tell you I have become a house plant Freak. I mean, I live yeah. in an apartment, so yeah. I don't have a garden, but I have, 
I have been rescuing plants from the floor at Whole Foods all summer. And I've got virtually every window now have a has a plant hanging from it. I love it. And and from what I understand, this is not unusual. This is a, a lot of people are doing this. So at least the purveyors of garden supplies and house plants are doing well. Yeah, well, I think it's a a, a create. We need to create because when you are making something, it is impossible to not have hope. Yeah, that's true. And also, it helps to have something to talk to when you live alone. You know, yes. I, I don't have pets, so I have my plants that I I talk to my plants. You know, I I think that's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> And they're always nice, right? They they're, are. Yeah, yeah, they're very nice. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Heather, thank you again. Stay healthy. And uh, I hope uh, you get a little bit of rain and some nice, cool ocean breezes. Yes, me too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high-quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you and thanks for tuning in.